had taught a real strong message on the devil. And so these little boys, when they were on their way home, the one boy turned to the other and he said, well, hey, what do you think about all this devil stuff? And the other boy replied, well, you know how Santa Claus turned out. It's probably just your dad. <laughs> well, I thought it was funny. Forget y'all. So Psalm 143 and verse 2, I want you to see what... The, I want you to see what the psalmist said here in Psalm 143 and verse 2. He said, Jesus, he heals the brokenhearted, and he does what? He bandages their wounds. Notice he said he heals what? He heals the brokenhearted. Now, you know, around here we're real strong on healing. We talk about physical healing a lot. But if you've been paying attention to the, the news over the last couple of years, uh, there's a thing called depression that's really been coming to light. Uh, just a few weeks ago, there was actually a... A, a pastor of a pretty large church over in California that actually killed himself. Uh, I've been battling depression for several months, and and a lot of this is starting to kind of kind of seep on out there, and people starting to talk about it. Uh, in the churches, we hear a lot about physical healing a lot of times, but we don't hear so much about the emotional healing, and so it's important that we look at that. Uh, and, and, and see what the Bible actually has to say about it. Here in Psalm 143, you see that Jesus, God, they do heal the what? Not just the physical body, not just physical healing, but there's also emotional healing. He said he heals the brokenhearted and he bandages their wounds. And so a lot of times what happens amongst us faith people is that uh, we don't want to talk about uh, the wounds. We don't want to talk about the hurts. Uh, we try to keep a straight face and act like we got it all together and just... You know, you ask somebody, how are you doing? I'm blessed, brother. I'm just, I'm on cloud nine. I mean, God's good. But you never know on the inside really what people are dealing with and what's going on behind closed doors. And so, uh, one, that's why you need some faith buddies. You need some people around you that you can just be honest with and talk to and, and somebody in your group that's not going to be a, uh, a faith Nazi. I mean, a confession Nazi, you know. You say the wrong thing and, oh, the devil's going to get you. You need to be able to acknowledge, hey, there's some issues, there's some problems, but your confession is, but you know what? God's good, and you know what? God's going to get me through this. But notice he's not denying, God isn't denying that there aren't some hurts, there aren't some hiccups, and there aren't some wounds, but he's telling you, hey, he'll take care of that too. And you'll find over in Luke chapter 4 when Jesus said, the, the Spirit of the Lord has come upon me. Look at what he says here. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's done what? He's anointed me to... Preach good news to who? Poor. So number one, he said, I am anointed to let the poor know that you don't have to be po no mo. Right? We found out a few months ago, you don't have to be poor anymore. You don't have to be broke. God wants you rich. He wants you wealthy because he wants you to be able to be able to blessing, be a blessing to other people. He said, so he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. And he's, he has sent me to announce release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. So you see some things about physical healing. But then look at this next part. And he said, and he sent me forth to deliver those who are oppressed. And the Amplified Bible breaks this down and says, those that are downtrodden, bruised, crushed, and broken down by calamity. And so what happens a lot of times is that, you know, something bad happens. Uh, really, depression is, is the direct result many times of a loss. Uh, it could be of a job. It could be of finances. It could be a physical thing. Uh, many times it's an identity type of crisis. Uh, a lot of times it's the result of a loss of a relationship, you know, or a family member, a death in the family, maybe one spouse or, you know, a, a child, which is just horrible. But, you know, these are real life issues that people face. And Jesus is letting you know that, you know what, I came to take care of you so you don't have to be poor no more. I came to take care of you uh, so you don't have to be in sin no more. I came to take care of you so you don't have to be sick anymore. And I came to take care of you so you don't have to be depressed anymore. See, the Christian life is a, is a life actually full of peace and full of joy. In all reality, and I know it's a sensitive subject, but in all reality, there should be no such thing as a depressed Christian because it really doesn't go together. Really doesn't go together. But Jesus said, I am anointed to do these things. He said, I came to heal and help the brokenhearted. Well, the good news is, is that not only did Jesus come to do that, but then he did. And so freedom from depression, uh, dealing with depression and being free from it, isn't something that you have to try to get God to do for you. It's something that's already been provided now. 
I mean, it's a part of the redemption package. It's a part of the salvation package that, yeah, you may be going through some tests and some trials and some bad stuff, and nobody's denying the, the wounds and the hurts. But while you're going through that, you can go on through, and you can come out on the other side. See, the difference between the Christian, the difference between the person who's filled and united with God and the person who isn't, is that when life circumstances happen, we can respond differently. You know, so somebody that's filled with God, we face the same storms as everybody else, but we come on out differently. It affects us differently. Yes, we may feel the hurts. We may, we may, we may feel like we're being beat down, but you know what? There's somebody to lift us up. Whereas if when you don't have Jesus, you're down, you're beat down, you're stuck down. But when you do have Jesus, you can get on out of there really, really quick. Amen. And so it's not denying that there aren't problems and there aren't hurts and, and, and there aren't losses. But despite those losses and despite those hurts, you can go through those things and deal with those things and still have peace. This is why Paul tells us when it comes to death. And he tells us over there in Thessalonians, when it comes to death, that as a Christian, as a believer, we don't have to grieve like everybody else. Now notice he said we still grieve, but he said you don't have to grieve like everybody else who doesn't have any hope. We have a hope. And so yes, we experience loss, but we can handle it differently. We can experience loss and yet not have to go through depression. We can experience loss, and yes, there's sadness because of loss, but it doesn't have to weigh us down and change who we are doesn't have to. And so, in all reality, and I know this is a very, very, very strong statement, but if you've been around me, you may as well get used to it because that's me. I know it's a very strong statement, but this is the reality, is this. If you are depressed, if you are down and out and you are depressed, it is not because Jesus hasn't made a way out. It's because of one of two things. Either one, you don't know you don't have, you don't have to be depressed, or number two, you haven't done anything about it. Because if Jesus has already provided what you need, then either you don't know about it, or if you do know about it, you just haven't done anything about it. And so, it, we want to spend a little time and just show you what you need to do about it. One, we see that it's available, uh, because he said he heals the brokenhearted, you know, and he bandages up their wounds. Jesus said, I'm anointed uh, to heal the brokenhearted, to help those who have been beat down, downtrodden. Uh, life circumstances have come and beat you down. I'm there to lift you up and give you peace. And it was a part of redemption. But just like with salvation, salvation has been made available to everybody. And the only reason, two reasons that people don't accept salvation is one, they don't know about it. Or number two, they just chose not to receive it. That's it. That's it. And so we want to give you some, some scriptural principles here and how to deal with it. But you need to understand how serious of an issue this is. You know, th this thing of going through life and just, you know, I'm, I'm sad and, and, and I'm down. Yeah, we're going to experience some of these, um, these emotions. The difference is, do you stay there? And, and the, the thing is, you cannot stay there. Because if you, if you stay there, what you begin to do is open up a door to Satan to come on in. And then it turns into a thing where it was just an emotional problem. Now it's a demonic problem. And if you don't think it can go there, believe me, it can go there. It can go there. The other thing is this, is that it's impossible for you to be in faith when you're depressed. It's impossible to be in faith when you're depressed. Think about it. Hebrews, it tells us that uh, the only way that we can please God is what? By faith. We, we live by faith. We walk by faith. We, uh, we, we please God by faith. We obtain the promises of God by faith. We stand by faith. But there's no way, no, no way you can do that if you're depressed. Why? Because you find over in Hebrews that peace and joy and faith, they are inseparable buddies. Where you find one, you're going to find the other two. The Bible says in Hebrews, it says, May the God of hope fill you with all peace and joy while you're believing. You're always going, where you find faith, you're going to find peace, and where you're going to find joy. If somebody's telling you that they're standing on the promises of God, and yet they're, they're sad, and they're always telling you about how bad it is, I can tell you they're not. If you're depressed, if you're sad about something, if you're frustrated, if you're anxious, or you're stressed, and yet you're saying you're in faith, you're not. If you're in faith, there's going to be peace there, and there's going to be joy there. Why? Because if you're truly in faith about something, you know God's got it, and God's going to bring you out of it. And as a result of you knowing the end 
of it. You'll be at peace about it. And you'll be happy about it. Right? And so it's just a very honest thing that you got to take a, a look at yourself. Be honest with yourself and say, hey, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm dealing with. But you can't fix something if you won't acknowledge that it's broke. And that's going on a lot in our circles is that we just got this face on and we know the right thing to say at the right time. And yet on the inside, I mean, things are just messed up. And it's not where it's supposed to be. So it's really important that, you know, we learn how to deal with, with sadness and we learn how to deal with depression uh, because you don't need to be there. God doesn't want you there. Jesus not only died uh, to take away your sins, he not only died to take away your sickness, he also died to make sure you could go through this life and be at peace and have a smile on your face the entire time, despite anything that you're going through. So let's look at some scripture here. Uh, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, and let's look at what Paul had to say about your thoughts. The first thing is... And learning to deal with it, you got to take control of your thoughts. Remember, we looked at last week, and we, we made this point in that Satan, he can't kill you, he can't steal from you, he can't destroy you without your help. Why? Because Satan is already a defeated foe, right? Jesus already defeated him. Uh, he already whipped his tail. Uh, he took the teeth out of the tiger. And so that's why in First Peter it says that Satan, he roars about as a roaring lion, not a roaring lion. He goes about as a roaring lion because he can't bite you. He can gum you, but he can't bite you. He needs your help to defeat you. Why? He's already defeated. And he's supposed to be under our feet because of our union with Christ. He's under Jesus' feet, and so he's under our feet. And so the only way that he can do anything to you is if you take your foot off of his neck and allow him to get up there and start doing some mess. And you open up the door for him to do some things. But he's always going to come at you through your thoughts. He's always going to try to get you to think on something. Why? Because the Bible says in Proverbs that as a man thinks, come on Bible scholars, as a man thinks, so is he. So what you think on is vitally, vitally important. What you think on is going to determine what you say, and what you say is going to determine what you see. So if you don't like what you're seeing, watch what you're saying. And if you don't like what you're saying, look at what you're thinking on. Because what you think on is going to determine all these different things. So look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. He said, we cast down every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we bring into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. Now notice this. He says, number one, we cast down. Well, you can't do that if you don't have the authority to do that and you don't have the power to do that. He said, every imagination uh, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In other words, those thoughts, those imaginations that come into your mind uh, that don't line up with the Word of God, that don't line up with who you are in Christ, that don't line up with what Jesus has already provided for you through redemption. Those imaginations and thoughts that don't line up with that, he said, we cast those down. We take authority over that. In the name of Jesus, I'm not thinking on that. You get out of here. And he said, we bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So in other words, you can control what you think on. And yet you and I, we have been there, done that. We all know there's been situations where we have allowed a thought that came into our head and we have dwelled on it and we have allowed it to take control of our mind. And once it takes control of your mind, it takes control of your emotions. How many of you have been in a situation, and I was there just a couple of days ago, and you can ask Lacey, and I had to ask God, forgive me, but I saw somebody who had done me wrong, and all of a sudden that thought came of what they had done to me, and I sat there and thought about it just a little bit too long, more than a second there, and all of a sudden that thought translated into emotions, and I began to feel on the inside what I felt back then. All it took was just sitting there and thinking just a little bit too long, and all of a sudden, uh, I'm back there again. Been there, done that, haven't we? We've all been there. You know, we've all been there. And, and allowing our mind to go places, and your mind is a powerful, powerful thing. Your mind is a powerful thing in that your mind controls how you feel. And so if you can control the mind, you can control everything. 
And that's why he said we bring it into obedience. We take it captive, we cast it down, and we bring it into obedience. In other words, you have absolute 100% control over what you think on. And it's your responsibility. Notice he didn't say pray for God to do it. Notice he didn't say pray, God help me not think this. No, he said, I gave you the authority, I gave you the power, I gave you the grace, you control what you think. If you don't like what's coming in your head, because Satan's always going to be bringing it, if you don't like it, take authority over it. You do it. You're never going to find God to tell you to pray for him to do something about the devil. He's going to tell you to do something about it, because when you got saved, you got born again, you became one with Christ. You are seated at the right hand of God in Christ and everything that's under Jesus' feet got under your feet and now it's your responsibility to do something about the devil in your life. Because you can sit there and pray for God to do something about the devil and you might as well say, twinkle, twinkle, little star, oh my God, how are you? Like, come do something for me. It doesn't matter because God ain't going to do nothing because he already did. He, he told you to do something about it. And so Brother Hagin used to say this all the time. He said, you can't control the birds flying over your head, but you can control whether they make a nest or not. Well, you can't keep the thoughts from coming to you. I mean, Satan's going to bombard your mind with all of these thoughts of offense and lust and, and, and all these things. And, and, you know, you can't stop the thoughts from coming, but you can control who comes in your house. Right? I mean, when you hear a knock on that door on your front door, you don't have to let those people in, do you? Why? Because that is your domain, that is your house, and you control who comes in there. You can't control the people that pass by, but you can control the people who come in your house. Well, it's the exact same thing with your mind. You can't control the environment that you're in, you can't control the thoughts that come your way, but you can control what you think on and what you meditate on. Why? Because it's ultimately going to decide how you feel, how you act, how you operate, how you live, and ultimately the results that you're going to get in life. So he says, it's your responsibility, you cast it down, you bring it into captivity, every stinking thought. You bring it into captivity, into the obedience of Jesus Christ. And then look at this other one. Look at Psalm chapter 42, and verse 4. This is David writing here, and, and I really like this one. This is the New Living Translation. Uh, some of you that grew up in church, you might know it this way. Why so downcast, O my soul? Anybody ever heard that? I remember when I was growing up, we had a little song that went along with it. I won't sing it for you, but... Uh, why well, so downcast all my soul? Put your hope in God. I mean, just sing in the Scripture. But it's interesting. David says this. He says, when I remember the way that it used to be, I'm sad. I'm saddened. And he said, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I'm going to put my hope in God. I'm going to praise Him once again. But notice, he, he lets us know why he's sad, why he's discouraged. He said, I'm remembering back to the way that it used to be. Isn't that what happens to us a lot of times? Well, when we start getting sad, we start getting depressed, we start thinking back to the way that it used to be. The relationship I used to have, you know, the situation I used to be in, the job that I used to have, the money I used to have, you know, the, the relationship, the family member I used to have. We start thinking about all those things, and then all it takes is, is Satan to, to get you to dwell on the bad piece of that, and then all of a sudden your emotions begin to happen. And, the, and these, the, these things, the, these chemicals begin to get released out of your brain and it begins to affect your body. And he said, I, when I think about the past, when I'm thinking about the good old days, it makes me sad. It makes me sad. But he said this, he said, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? In other words, it's this, sometimes you're going to have to preach to yourself. Here's David looking at himself, looking in the mirror and saying, why are you so sad? Why are you so discouraged? Sometimes you're going to have to look yourself in the mirror and say, what is wrong with you? We need to pull on our big boy pants. We need to get the pacifier out of our mouth. Put the bottle down. And he said, I'm going to put my hope in God. I'm going to praise him once again. I'm going to praise him once again. So in other words, you could say it like this, is that you know, the, the number one thing you need to do in dealing with depression and dealing with those things is that you need to recognize it and then you need to control your thought life. You need to maintain your thought life. The, the, the second thing is you need to stay on the positive 
Because there's always going to be something positive in your life. It may look like all hell broke loose, but I guarantee you there's something that you can praise God for. There's something that you can be thankful for. There's something you can be thankful for. That's why I like these mission trips, and that's why I was, I'm so excited every time we go and, and we can take Jake with us because I want him to see how good he's actually got it. Because it doesn't matter who you are, where you, where you are, there's always somebody that's got it a whole lot worse than you. Now, Jake, at this standpoint, you know, he, he's got like, I don't know, like 50 infinity characters, and he thinks because he doesn't have these other two, you know, he's missing out on life. And then we take him over there to, you know, to, to Kenya or Samoa, and he sees these kids walking around, and, you know, they're excited because of a cardboard box, you know. Or you go over there and you complain about your bathroom because you don't have the latest and greatest, and then you go down to Cusco, and, and you're lucky to get some hot water without getting shocked. You know, or you complain about your house because my house is so small, and, and you know, my friends, they got this big house. God, how come you haven't given me a bigger house? And I've worked so hard and done this. And then, you know, you go down to Samoa, and they're living in these, the, these falas, and it's basically a pole barn with dirt floors, and you see them just excited and wanting to feed you and do wonderful things. And then it makes you feel bad about yourself for being a whiner and a griper and a complainer. But he said, I'm going to put my hope in God. I'm going to praise him yet again i'm gonna praise him yet again and so the the third thing is after you after you you take control of your thoughts and and you learn to stay on the positive then you start thanking god for all the good stuff he said i'm gonna praise him once again in other words he's letting you know he had stopped praising god and, and he had started complaining and he's whining and he's pouting he said i'm gonna praise god once again, so you need to look around and you need to find something you can praise God for. I mean, if it's just the fact that you've got some clothes on your backs and, and, and some food in your pantry to eat and you've got a bed to sleep on, man, you can praise God for that. Because I know some people don't even have a bed. I remember walking into a village and there were seven people in a little shack that was made up of scrap wood and tin and cardboard and they had one bed and all seven of them slept in it. I mean, I can play at night when Jake comes in at 3 o'clock in the morning and gets in the middle of us in our king-size bed. That bothers me because I don't want anybody touching me. And I'm trying to get him out. Here's seven of them. Like, there's always something to be thankful about. And especially living here in America, there's always something to be thankful about. I don't care if you, like, you don't like your president or you do like your president, you don't like our, our government, and you think that America is horrible. America is great. Compared to every other country, America is wonderful. We've got so many things to be thankful for here. But, you know, in the midst of that, we still do experience loss. We experience hurt. We have wounds because that's just a part of life. We're going to go through things. Jesus said in John 16, he said, in this world you will face trouble. But, he said, be of what? Be of good cheer. Put a smile on your face. Be happy because I have overcome the world. So he's not saying that you're not going to experience things. He said you will experience things, but your outcome and the way that you respond to it and go through it can be different than everybody else. You can still go through it with a smile on your face. Let me give you another example. Look at Paul, the Apostle Paul. Look over at Philippians chapter 4. The book of Philippians, Paul wrote this from prison. He had been in prison for a couple of years, and he writes the book of Philippians from the prison cell. And it's absolutely amazing that in the book of Philippians, like 20 times, he uses the word rejoice. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, he says this. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And Paul's writing this from prison, and he's been there for a couple of years. And this ain't the prison like we've got today. I used to work in the prison system, and, and you know, it's kind of nice. I mean, there's cable TV. You can go to college for free. You can get you a good meal. You can go to the gym and work out. No membership fees. I mean, it's kind of a cushy life if you don't have anything else. And I remember I sat with a warden. I was with the warden and this other individual, and, and we would see the guys when they would come in and assign them jobs and housing and stuff. And there was this one guy I saw, and, and, and I started taking polls. And there was one guy, and in about two years, this was his seventh time that, that he was there. He'd get out, he'd go and commit, he'd come back. Get out, go commit, come back. And I asked him one day, I said, why do you keep doing this? Like, you're, you're almost 60, and you just keep coming back. And he said, well, I don't have a house. I don't have any family. I don't have a job. So here I get fed, I get clothed, and I got a place to sleep. 
I mean, I couldn't argue with him. I mean, American prison's pretty good. But this prison at Philippi wasn't so nice. I mean, you can imagine, he's probably down there. You know there's no running water and nice little, you know, quartz countertop sinks. And there's no toilet. He's got a hole on the floor, if that. And there's rats all over the place. And he says, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. I think he might have been preaching to himself. And yet he's encouraging you. He said, rejoice in the Lord when? Always. That means in every situation you're going through, despite the loss that you've had, despite the hurt that you've had, despite the emotional hurt that you have on the inside, despite the, the, the wounds you have, he said in all situations, in every situation, every circumstance, rejoice. Twenty times he says rejoice, 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 rejoice in four chapters. Rejoice. Here he said rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say what? Rejoice. And then in verse 6, look at this. He says, don't worry about anything, but in every situation, just pray. Tell God what you need, and, and check it out again. He says, and what? And thank him for all that he's what? Done. So you'll notice this thing about rejoicing and about being thankful. Rejoicing and being thankful. He said, thank him for all of that you've done, or he's done, and then you will experience what? You will experience God's peace. So again, just like before with the devil, he's not telling you to pray for God to give you peace. He's telling you what you need to do to experience the peace that God has already provided. He said you need to get your eyes off the situation and you need to get your eyes back on God. And once you get your eyes back on God, you start realizing all the good that he's actually done for you. And as a result of the good that he's done for you and you get your focus right, he said then you'll begin to thank him and praise him. And as a result, you'll experience the peace of God that surpasses your every understanding. He said it'll guard your heart. And it will guard your mind. So in other words, the thoughts that are coming to you and the emotions that you're feeling, he said, if you'll get your eyes back on God and begin to thank him and praise him, it'll guard your mind from the thoughts and it'll guard your heart from the bad emotions. He said, you experience the peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and, and your mind as you live in Jesus Christ. And then look at verse 8. Look what he says here. He said, now one final thing. I want you to fix your thoughts on what is true. He said, I want you to fix your thoughts on what is true. It's honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and what? Worthy of praise. Notice he said one final thing. I want you to do what with your thoughts? He said, I want you to fix them. In other words, I want you to set them right there and make it stay there. Why? Because you know it, it doesn't take no time for your thoughts to start going all over the place. How many times have you sat down to read your Bible or you sat down to spend just a little bit of time praying and all of a sudden as soon as you close your eyes, you're thinking about your grocery list. You're thinking about your to-do list. And you thought about what you need to do tomorrow, what you didn't do yesterday. Like your mind starts going everywhere. He said you got to fix your thoughts. <laughs> 